Welcome to Transformative Principle, where you learn how to be a leader and not just a manager of a to-do list. I am your host, Jethro Jones. You can find me on Twitter at Jethro Jones. I just want to take a minute and remind you to check out conradchallenge.org and look at the kinds of things you can do to support students. The Conrad Challenge is really about facilitating 21st century skills of creativity, collaboration, critical thinking, communication. So go and check that out at conradchallenge.org. And if you missed my interview with Nancy Conrad, go check that out as well at transformativeprinciple.org slash Nancy Conrad. Hey there, this is Danny Sunshine Bauer from Better Leaders, Better Schools, and the School Leadership Series, a proud member of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to right now. The opinions expressed are those of the individual hosts. Make sure you check out all the other great podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com and get ready because the learning begins in three, two, one. Welcome to Transformative Principle. Today, I am so excited to have my good friend, Joel Lavin, on the podcast. He is the principal of uh, Camino del Rio School or River Road Elementary, and it is a bilingual dual immersion school, and I'm excited to talk with Joel today. So, Joel, thank you so much for being part of Transformative Principle. Well, thank you. I'm really excited to be on this morning and so excited to talk about dual language with you. I'm excited too. I am fortunate because I've gotten to know you very well over the last year or so through the mastermind. And so I know that we are just going to barely scratch the surface of the value that you bring to your school every single day. And I'm excited to talk with you because I want to talk about dual immersion. But I also want to talk about how you have handled some challenging aspects in your school over the last year. And what I am amazed by is your, when it's stressful, you stay calm and focus on the future and focus on solutions. And that is really good. So we didn't talk about talking about that challenging stuff before, but if you're open, I'd like to to talk about that also, because I think it's a really powerful story. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, dual language is uh, just like any kind of uh, big changes in schools. It's big changes, uh, which means that you have to build uh, a lot of uh, stability in in your thinking, I guess, as you start to move forward with a mission and a vision in a school. And uh, one of the things I love about uh, dual language is that the mission and the vision is so transparent. Everyone's there because they want their child to become bilingual, biliterate, and hopefully learn a lot about the culture of that uh, dual immersion program. So uh, with that comes lots of big changes and a school completely transforms when they go through that kind of a change. If a school goes from an English only environment to a a dual language environment. So I'd love to talk about that. Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm excited about this because You've been there for five years, so you've seen a lot of change. You've built a new building, and and so it's a it's a big process that you've gone through. And as we're talking, if you're listening to this, I just want you to think for a moment about what the change process looks like at your school. And one of the things that I often talk about is, do you want to be the principal of just another school? And I think most principals, and especially if you're listening to this, you don't want to be the principal of just another school. You want to leave an impact. You want to be a transformative principal. And so as we're talking about this, we're going to be talking a lot about a school that has a dual language environment, but any kind of change that you're trying to bring, I think a lot of the uh, practices and principles will will make sense. And so, so let's talk first about why why bilingual is best and what you, why you think that's so important? Yeah, well, that's a great question. First of all, I uh, studied at uh, the University of Oregon. I'm uh, actually a Southern California native, but I moved to Oregon in the 90s and I studied Spanish as a major and I also studied general science and I was a middle school science teacher and absolutely loved working in the middle school environment. But I also always knew that I wanted to work with Uh, families and students who spoke another language. And I chose to study Spanish because I wanted to connect and provide better access for my students in school. That was the main reason that I studied Spanish in the first place. And so when I had the opportunity to work in a dual language environment, uh, I jumped at it because I knew 
that I would have more opportunities to speak with families in another language uh, than ever before. And so that's been extremely valuable for me uh, in my career, but it's also been very fulfilling and enriching as an experience as a leader in a school to be able to communicate with everyone that comes in the school. Uh, we're lucky uh, in that we have seven or eight languages represented in the school. I don't talk to all those people in those languages, but it really provides a beautiful opportunity for it. And the reason I uh, kind of like the theme of bilingual is best is because it's really good for all students to become bilingual. We're um, a nation who is just starting to realize how valuable it is to have more than one language. And dual language across the United States is growing dramatically. Lots of families uh, in many, many states are starting to realize that it's very beneficial to the brain to have more than one language as a skill and as a, as a skill set. It's beneficial for a child because they can prevent ongoing diseases like later in their life when they're an old person. Um, it's also very good for the brain in that it builds vocabulary and uh, students can also uh, have better access to more abstract thinking when they become bilingual. And when they build their funds of knowledge in both those languages, they live in one place in the brain. Uh, Broca's area is an amazing thing and all the other kinds of uh, brain research that are going on out there right now show that students' uh, brains don't discern what language they have that knowledge in. They just access that knowledge. So if a student learns something in Spanish, they're gonna access it uh, from their brain wherever it is. And uh, that's another beautiful thing about it. It also helps improve literacy in many ways. Uh, when you learn in Spanish, English is a very difficult language to learn reading in. And uh, because Spanish is very predictable uh, in, a, in our dual language environment, it's very helpful for students to learn these sets of rules and then to use those uh, sounds and those uh, phenome segmentations that they learn in Spanish to get those patterns down. And then once they've learned that language and they've learned how to read, they do it once and then they've learned that skill and then they can transfer it to English. So that's one of the major tools that we use to help students gain literacy. And it's very exciting to watch. It's very fun to see the students use both languages at the same time, no matter where they are in their environment. And to see students bridging culture, uh, talking in Spanish on the playground, talking to their parent, coming to the office and speaking with the uh, office staff about something that happened out on the playground in Spanish or in English. And uh, it's just a beautiful environment to be a part of. So I, I am also uh, bilingual. I speak Russian as well. I studied Spanish and, and then Greek when I was in college. And so I love language. I think that it's beautiful and amazing. And it teaches you so much more about a culture when you understand the language. And, and there's real value in that. In fact, just last night, I was at Barnes & Noble wearing my Russian shopka that I have. And a woman saw it and commented on it and asked who made it. And I told her I got it in Russia. And then she started speaking to me in Russian and said, oh, I lived in Russia. I'm from there and I speak Russian. And so I was able to converse with her in Russian. And that does not happen very often. However, it happens more than now that I live in Alaska. But it doesn't happen very often. But it's really cool when there is a, a difficulty communicating and then you have that commonality. And it's like that woman was my best friend. After that, I saw her a couple more times in the store. She was all excited to see me again. And, you know, that just that being able to converse with somebody when you wouldn't have been able to before is a really powerful experience. And so, so how long has your school been a dual immersion school and how long have you been there as principal? Okay, well, our school has had the dream of becoming a dual language school for a long time. So uh, there's actually two schools that uh, lit, were kind of in the same neighborhood in the northern part of Eugene. Uh, and, and in the 2000s, early 2000s, one of the schools closed. It was called Whitaker School. And that school merged with River Road around 2000, 2001. And in that time, the Spanish speakers that were at Whitaker School were a strong community and they had a strong voice. And they came to our school. And as some of the listeners might know, when you merge a school, it can be quite difficult. So the school actually changed the name from River Road only 
to River Road El Camino del Rio at that time. So our official name, if you look us up on the state report card or something like that, is River Road backslash El Camino del Rio. So my guess is we have like one of the longest names uh, in the state for a school. However, because of that change in that environment in the early 2000s, the families that moved and started to attend our school uh, started to demand more and they wanted to have their home language be spoken in the school and they wanted to be recognized and visible in the school. So the leaders at the time worked really hard to help connect folks across different cultures. And what they found was it was really valuable to have parent and family engagement in the beginning of that process and to make sure that there was someone who was a solid person that would be able to help students and families connect across different cultures. So we established a family resource center at the time. And um, the woman who runs that family resource center is still here. And uh, that's actually been one of the, the threads all along that's helped make our school so strong. And as families were able to speak more and feel more comfortable in this school environment with someone in the school, they continue to ask for more things. And they wanted to have a heritage language program originally. Uh, so then that leader left. Her name was Sarah Green Kramer. Uh, in the 2000s, and she became a, a director in our district. Later on after that, uh, another man uh, named Paco Furlan, who works in California now, he actually helped make the dream come true. And he was a leader for about six or seven years, and he did research. He brought teachers in to do research projects. They went down to California to several conferences. And with that, and with a uh, council, they established that they wanted to create a dual language program in the mid to late 2000s. 2009, uh, the district established it officially as a dual language two-way immersion program. And we were actually paired up with another school that was going to be doing technology immersion. Sounds kind of funny now. Everybody's immersed in technology, right? Yeah, but our, neighbor, our neighboring school is uh, called Howard Elementary, and they are a technology immersion environment. And so what they do is they offer an alternative for families that don't want to have that dual language experience, but want to have a technology immersion experience. And so we share students, and um, that was part of the solution is to help families that weren't interested in that experience to have an, another option or a choice. Uh, but all along, the voice of the parents, the voice of the community was, we want this to happen and we're going to make this happen. So there were some tough times. There were some bumpy periods during that transition period between 2009 and about 2014. And our test scores weren't very good. It was difficult to get the school going and strong and to get the right resources. Of course, we're talking 2009, 2010, when uh, we had, you know, one of the biggest national you know downturns and, and uh, really a recession. Some people called it a depression. And so uh, schools were really hit hard during that time, and our achievement uh, was also suffering as we tried to shift things and change things around. So around 2014, after lots of supports were provided for the school, I came in and I helped really strengthen the program. And uh, May 2014, I was on a dual language team, and we met and we talked and we built a master schedule that met what we call the language allocation. So we made sure that the school had the right amount of time to learn Spanish literacy, the right amount of time to learn in other content areas like math and uh, science and so on. And as we began to allocate that, we were able to create a structure for our students so that there was clear guidelines of what to use language-wise with what content area, uh, what language to use and what content area to match that with. And uh, that's a constant ongoing evolution and process, but our staff work really closely with us to make sure that we have the right amount of Spanish practice and the right amount of English practice in our school. And having a two-way program means that you have a population of students that are Spanish speakers and a population of students that are English speakers in their homes, and that those students are sharing their role models for each other. And that's super, super vital. The demographics is important. So when we say two-way immersion, we really mean the population is learning both directions. And a lot of people say, oh, you're an immersion program, you're a Spanish immersion program. No, we're a two-way immersion program. We're immersing students in English and we're immersing students in Spanish. And uh, it's just important that, that folks understand that, that that's a really part, uh, 
part and parcel of, of, of building an effective program that's a two-way program. There's lots and lots of other dual language uh, programs out there, and they all have different ways of doing it. There's some that uh, are considered stronger, and there's researchers out there who propose that the best way to learn and the highest achievements will occur when you use certain strategies, and um, they've done lots of research on that. But it's also up to the community and the voice of the parents and the students to help make decisions about how to make sure that those things happen. And all along the way, over these last five years, since I started in 2014, we've had stakeholders at the table to discuss the structure of our program to make sure it improves and that parents feel heard, students feel heard, teachers feel heard, and that it feels like a um, environment where we're shaping it and we're building it together. Yeah, you know, I think that that is so vitally important and something that we talk about a lot in education is getting that community voice involved and that we just don't do a very good job of. I personally believe that the future of education is really hyper-localized education, that the school community has a hand in designing the school to meet the needs that that community feels they need. And so, you know, that's that's the kind of work that I'm trying to do. And it's definitely difficult work, especially if that has not been the tradition in the area. And whereas in your school, that the parents were driving that a lot of the way, which I think is really valuable. And that's a powerful way to do it. How is it that you engage people or do you even engage people who aren't really interested in being engaged at that level? Like what percentage of your parents are actually like, giving feedback about how the school should be run and that kind of stuff. What, what's your perspective on that? Uh, that's a great question. I think that there's some families who in the past, especially when I first got to the school, were reluctant dual language families. That's the way I would describe them as reluctant. Um, they didn't necessarily believe in the tenets of a, of a dual language program that, you know, why can't my kid learn this content in English? And why are you talking to the students in, caf- in the cafeteria in Spanish right now? That that doesn't make sense to me. And so a lot of it is that conversations that we have with parents as they learn and they become accustomed to the environment. And a lot of times when they learn the reasons why we do things the way that we do, they support the program. However, there's still some families who I've spoken with that say, hey, you know, this is not working for my kid. My kid is not learning. They're not accessing their learning because they don't understand the Spanish. And that's a real struggle for them. And we're going to leave. And uh, so I think it's important to understand that kind of like you were just saying, there are some families that, you know, maybe in a new program that don't understand the program or find that their values, their personal values don't mesh with the values of the school. And that's okay. Uh, when we live in an environment where there is choice, uh, and our school district uh, puts choice up there as one of the highest things that they value, they have to honor that. And um, it's important that parents do have those options uh, and make you know clear decisions about where their child wants to go. So that's something that sometimes people want to feel like they're connected to the school, or as you say, as you say, sometimes that they're enrolled in the school, like uh, Seth Godin mentions. And engagement with those parents is super important. Um, if they don't believe in the values in the school and they don't believe in the mission and the vision that students going to be bilingual, bicultural, and biliterate, they're not in the right place. And I need to help them find a right place for their child. And I can work with my district and make sure that they have the right uh, environment for their kid to learn in. Yeah. So- so I don't know if that helps you describe it better, but yeah. No, that that's good. I think that the challenge we face is that we we often want to please everybody. That's kind of in our nature as educators, and we want everybody to be happy and everybody to, you know, think that we're the best school in the world. And being able to say where there is choice available, because I think that that's an important aspect. That if your school is the only choice people have, then you need to work really hard to meet everybody's needs. But if there's a lot of different options, then it's, I think, way more important to really focus on what you want to be, how your school is recognized, whether that's dual language immersion, or whether that is technology immersion, or a STEAM school, or whatever. There's so many different ways you can go. But that that piece there of this is who we are, and this is what we stand for, 
And we want you parents to understand that. And if this isn't what you want also, then let's find a place that's a better fit for you. And this morning in the mastermind, when you and I were talking, you talked about some of the the grieving that happens when people's school gets changed. And I think that you made some really salient points. And so can you talk a little bit about how people grieve when their school does go through a big change? Well, yeah. Uh, One of the things that happens is schools that are um, struggling with their identity when they're changing from one uh, kind of school to another, I think that um, a lot of times there's teachers that don't believe in the big changes that are happening. And sometimes those teachers uh, or they don't have a skill. You know, we went from an environment where we had uh, English only speakers and maybe two or three Spanish speakers in the school to all of a sudden every single teacher in the school is bilingual and every single office uh, staff member is bilingual, except for maybe three or four people. And then there's other variations of those in between, you know, people that know Spanish but don't speak it very well or don't produce the language. So during that process of people leaving, uh, people were very sad and bitter and There were differences of opinion for each and every uh, individual that saw the changes happening. And some of those teachers were amazing staff members that were here back in uh, 2010, 2011, uh, before some of those major changes occurred. And it was very sad for the school as those teachers had to leave because they couldn't help maintain the program as we were changing it. And uh, when those teachers left, Uh, there was sadness and it changed the dynamics of the school. As we all know, the teachers and the personality of the teachers are a major factor in school culture. And when you have someone that's an amazing individual, amazing teacher, and they have to get up and leave and go to another school and become part of that school environment, it really can shift the culture very quickly. So that sadness uh, was tangible and real for many and um, then there was a lot of blaming and, and sadness and, and kind of shame that we couldn't help our students achieve at high levels because the morale was so low. Once we got past uh, all of those move outs, there was a little bit more brightness and hope. And when I came in, I kind of came in after a lot of that really tough activities happened and um, in some of those, some of those events. And, and so what I tried to do is help the school heal and recognize it, own it, understand it, and reach out to some of those staff members and talk to them and ask them for advice or support because I knew that they were still valuable members of our community and that I needed to ask them about the school culture because it's kind of like when you're, when you're braiding um, you know, some bread or some different you know, pieces of string. You have to take all of those values of the past and connect them and mesh them to the future. And the history of the school doesn't go away. It's super important. And the neighborhood supports the school. So they also have to understand the values of that community and how it works. And going to community events, uh, being present, going to parades, uh, going to the uh, like River Road Community found, uh, Foundation or, or organization and talking to them about our program. All of those things are very important in helping heal uh, as you make a major shift or major transformation in your in your school, which ultimately reflects your community. We have a group like lots of micro communities all in one place in our school at once, and they all represent different uh, cultures and and facets of our community. And so I have to make sure that I'm weaving in uh, all of those um, people's values and beliefs uh, and help it all work and, and create some kind of harmony uh, as, as we go through all that process. Yeah, that's, that's really fascinating. Now, you talked about the micro communities a little bit and you just touched on that, but I think that that's a, an important thing to address as well, that you have the community that your school serves, but then there are little pockets of different groups. So in my school, for example, we have our community, which is made up of certain people. And then we also have people who live out the road, China Hot Springs Road, which is this long road that has, you know, it's like 50 miles long. And then people live all out along there and they come to our school. And then people live way out north in the boonies of Fairbanks. And then we have a military population that's a micro community as well. And then we have the, the uh, homes that are immediately surrounding the school that is another different type. And so all those different places have 
very different families living in those areas that value different things. And, and it's important to pay attention to that. How do you, in your school, figure out what those micro communities are and how, how they can, um, what's the word, how you can serve them better? That's what I was looking for. That's just a little question, like no big deal. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot to that. I mean, and your community is very different. So you're probably thinking about it in a different way. But I think that you're on the right path of of thinking about who is in your community. Um, We have a wide variety of uh, what we call Latinx uh, community members in our school. And um, we have Latino families that are from Oaxaca. Uh, So they're from a region in Mexico. And um, they speak a specific language. So actually their families are multilingual or they're trilingual. And being able to communicate with those families was hard at first for our school. But we were able to establish a strong relationship with them and understand what their values are in the school and how they can bring richness into our school. In the English language learning community, um, we call that uh, funds of knowledge. Every Every member of our school has funds of knowledge, or sometimes in the past we call that Uh, cultural capital. There's sociologists who've called that in the past. And we have to figure out what it is that those uh, community members bring to our school and how we can enrich their lives. And so because we have prioritized Spanish as a language, and uh, let's be honest, Spanish is a minority language in Eugene, Oregon. It's not the dominant language. We tell our family members uh, and, and community members that the priority of our school is to elevate that language of Spanish and elevate those cultures. And so once we explain that to everyone and we ask them, Hey, you know, we want you to prioritize learning Spanish, support the Spanish and learn about all of these other cultures that all of these uh, families bring to our environment. So that helps a lot because when everyone understands what the mission and the vision of the school is, They'll buy into that more. However, we still have families that say, hey, you know, we want to celebrate Halloween. Why don't, why don't we celebrate Halloween at, at your school? But we also, we do celebrate Dia de los Muertos. And what I say is, hey, we actually study several holidays in our school. We study uh, Thanksgiving. We help understand uh, during uh, Indigenous Peoples Month of November um, what the traditions and cultures are uh, that are from our region and from our state uh, and the nine tribes of Oregon. We also study uh, what these other cultures do in the fall. And so what we say is, hey, we're studying all these cultures and that's the priority of our school. And the Spanish is the highest priority of the school. So we honor your traditions. And we also have these other events that happen in our school that are cultural activities where we ask all families to share their traditions and for their children to learn and become uh, more knowledgeable about their uh, heritage and their cultural background. And we give students opportunities to share those things. I think that sometimes when families do come to our school, their values reflect what they want their children to learn in the school. I think that one thing I have noticed over time is that a lot of our English speaking families want their children to learn Spanish and they forget about the cultural aspect of the school. And a lot of our Spanish speaking families want their children to maintain their Spanish. That's why they choose to have their children in a dual language environment, because they know that if they maintain their language, they're going to be able to communicate with all their family members. And so I have to take into account that each of those groups, as they come into the school, want different things out of the school. And I have to help clarify why we do what we do and help everyone understand um, what the values are of the school so that people can kind of put their values aside and say, okay, this is the values of the school. And these are the things that we need to do to move forward, regardless of what our stronger personal values are from this micro community or that. Yeah. Very, very fascinating. So that was my first part of my interview with Joel Lavin. I hope that you enjoyed that. We're going to talk next week about a crisis that he faced and how he worked through that crisis. And it was fascinating. I was so fortunate because I got to see through the mastermind, how uh, he dealt with that in real time, which was really cool. And he'll share that with you next week. So thank you so much. And if you uh, enjoyed what he was talking about and you've thought about joining the mastermind, a new year's resolution of improving yourself is a great one. And so please uh, 
go to transformativeprinciple.org slash mastermind and schedule a chat with me so that we can figure out how to help you achieve your goals in 2019 and make 2019 your best year ever. Thanks so much. And I appreciate you listening. We'll see you next week.